This podcast includes information provided by the issuer and does not express the views of the interviewer. This podcast may also include forward-looking statements by the issuer that involve certain risks and uncertainties to its business. Because forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, the issuer's actual results could differ from those indicated in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft, and you're listening to episode 69. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rkraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the microcap message. For this episode, I spoke with Doug Casey, founder of Casey Research. Doug is a best-selling author, world-renowned speculator, and libertarian philosopher with more than 40 years' experience investing in the natural resource sector. His first book, Crisis Investing, discusses how to profit from periods of economic turmoil. It spent multiple weeks as number one on the New York Times bestseller list and became the best-selling financial book of 1980. Since then, Doug has written four books and has appeared on hundreds of radio and TV shows, sharing his insights into politics, economics, and investment markets. He will be a speaker at the upcoming Sprott Natural Resource Symposium in Vancouver, BC, July 17 through 20. You can purchase your ticket at www.naturalresourcesymposium.com. I was presented with the opportunity to interview Doug Casey, and I couldn't pass it up. As a listener to Planet Microcap, just remember, I enjoy learning about all different investing approaches and philosophies because at the end of the day, there's no one way to make money in the market. Today, will you be hearing about a new approach to value or growth investing? No. However, the natural resource sector makes up a big component of what we consider microcap stocks, and Doug is someone that's been investing in this space for quite a long time. With that said, the goal for this episode is to share his insights on what's worked for him when investing in this highly speculative market. Thank you again for tuning in to episode 69, and I would like to introduce Doug Casey, founder of Casey Research. Doug, welcome to the Planet Microcap podcast. Thanks, Bobby. It's nice to be here with you, although I'm not in the office with you. I'm well, you at know, a ranch outside of Aspen, Colorado. So if we have a glitch in the audio, let's attribute it to the satellite connection. Well, you know, we're with each other virtually, I guess. So uh, I, I do appreciate that <laughs> you taking the time. So um, to get started here, you know, I, I would love to uh, get your background and, and how you got into the, the wide world of, of finance. Well, uh, accidentally, I think is the answer to that. Um, I'm a generalist. I've always been a, a generalist. Um, I like to cover everything under the sun in my reading and my thinking and so forth. Um, I don't have uh, an MBA or anything like that. In fact, uh, when anybody comes to work for KC Research, if they have an MBA, I, I question their um, wisdom and ask them, what's the matter with you that you spent scores of thousands of dollars and two years of your time to have professors who have generally no business experience yapping at you about business? So, in fact, I don't believe in formal education, although I have one. I graduated from Georgetown University. That and... Ten dollars will get me a cup of coffee in Tokyo. So um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm answering the question well or not, but um, well, uh, I'm I'm what's known as an autodidact uh, that uh, just reads a lot. I've traveled a lot. Uh, I've been to a, about 155 countries, uh, most of them several times. I've lived in ten countries. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I simply try to learn from my environment. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I lack academic credentials. And in fact, 
I mostly despise academic credentials. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Um, you know, well, where I was going with that is, you know, I know you've been in the business for, you know, over 40 years and I, th I there's a good, there's, it's probably more actually. And, you know, what, what I really want to know is, you know, what, what inspired you to, you know, uh, cause we're going to get to your book crisis investing in a, in a few questions, but you know, before that, you know, what got you interested in finance, the stock market, you know, what was that impetus? You know, did you, uh, were you introduced to it as a kid from your parents? I mean, in school, you know, what, what was it that got you hooked? Well, uh, when I was a kid, uh, like a lot of kids in that era, and even today probably, <clears throat> the first thing I wanted to be when I grew up was a paleontologist, uh, which is to say I was fascinated by dinosaurs. Uh, but paleontology is a um, division of geology. So I started exploring that and rocks and everything that has to do with geology, just reading on my own. Uh, at the same time, or a little later actually, I got interested in economics uh, because um, I like money uh, as a philosophical concept and as a practical reality. <clears throat> it allows you to do all kinds of things that you cannot do without money. So um, my interest in geology uh, combined with an interest in economics, actually what set off my interest in economics was reading a book by Henry Hazlitt called Economics in One Lesson. It's only about 150 pages long, and it's a book that absolutely everybody should read. It's completely brilliant, completely accurate, in my opinion. So I put together uh, geology, uh, long-term interest, uh, reading and economics, that book, and a book by my old friend. He wasn't a friend at that time, but he became a very close friend, Harry Brown. I read his book, How to Profit from the Coming Devaluation. I read that book in 1970, and uh, it rang completely true to me, completely accurate, uh, thoughtful, logical. And uh, I started buying gold coins and uh, started looking into gold stocks. So uh, that's how I got into this little niche where I do, do a lot still, which is you know, small mining stocks, mm -hmm. micro caps. And the fact is, worse than micro caps, I'm involved with a lot of nano caps. Mm. In fact, sometimes I get involved with pico caps. So... Uh, Tiny, teeny weeny little stocks. <laughs> Pipo Castle, I'm guessing that's sub 10 million. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like a few dollars. Gotcha. <laughs> so, so then, okay, so you, uh, you, you read a couple books that, that uh, got you very interested in the idea of uh, in, in commodities and gold, and, and, that took you, and that took you down the rabbit hole of gold stocks. And that's what introduced you really to this world of microcaps. You know, what about microcaps um, in the, uh, I mean, at the time you, you would still call them junior mining uh, stocks. You know, what about them was so interesting to you where you kind of, that's where you really landed and built your career from there? Well, it became obvious to me after a while that um, most people, most uh, conventional, um, they would say legitimate uh, investment types will invest 100% of their capital and very reasonably hope to get perhaps 10% return on it per year. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Uh, but I came up with the idea that because junior resource stocks, not just gold, but silver, uranium, copper, nickel, zinc, oil, you name it. Uh, it occurred to me that since junior resource stocks are the most volatile class of securities on the planet, they're more volatile than internet stocks. They're more volatile than anything. Uh, I mean, they regularly, as a group, uh, go up a 1,000% and then lose 95% 
uh, which incidentally is lose more than they gain, because most of them are complete garbage, which um, uh, is a point that needs to be emphasized. But um, I thought, why not look at these? Because here I can deploy 10% of my capital for the potential of 1,000% gains. Uh, and that sounded better to me than deploying 100% of my capital for the potential of 10% gains over the course of a year, incidentally. Mm -hmm. So that, that attracted me. Mm -hmm. uh, now, volatility is not a bad thing. Uh, it can be a very bad thing, uh, but it can be a very good thing depending on whether your timing is reasonable. So uh, that's... Um, and also, I've got to say, I've discovered that I'm actually very lazy. And um, <laughs> uh, the nice thing about resource stocks is that most of the time you shouldn't be in the market. So it's the kind of a market where um, if you're in the market for, let's say, one out of five years and you, your timing is right and it's a good year, you can kind of retire for the next four years. So that's another thing that um, speaks well of them. Now, if I would really been smart, I would have known that Warren Buffett was an investment genius. And I just would have done nothing with my money since, mm, since he reconstituted Berkshire Hathaway in the 60s. And I just would have done that. And that would have been super duper. And that would have been <laughs> even more brainless. But well, I wasn't that smart. So... <laughs> <laughs> but you know, every everybody finds a niche, mm -hmm. and this is this is my niche, and that's treated me very very well. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's interesting you say that because one thing that we I, I highlight here on the podcast is that you know um, each investor I talk to has a different way that they've been approaching the microcap market. You know, I everywhere from Brent Cook, who is an exploration geologist who made his money looking at junior mining stocks, to uh, a uh, number of value investors that I've had on here who, you know, tend to stay away from resources, but it's because they just, they don't understand it. You know, they, they didn't take the time to understand the geology and what a 43 101 is something that, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you did and it, and it stuck, right? Yeah. Yeah. After the, yeah, uh, uh, of course, but, uh, I've got to emphasize also mm -hmm. that, um, the mining business or the mining exploration, they're, they're, it's a crappy business. Hmm. Uh, an intelligent investor like Warren Buffett or Benjamin Graham, actually, who wrote that book, of The Intelligent Investor, Buffett or Graham wouldn't dream of investing in mining stocks or mining exploration stocks, and for very good reasons. Uh, mining is a crappy industry. It's uh, the days of, uh, of we found a gold mine and we're going to be rich forever. Those days are over for lots of reasons. Uh, the reason why kids aren't going into mining today uh, is because they see it as a dinosaur industry. It's a 19th century choo-choo train industry where guys are out playing in the dirt with big yellow trucks. But there's no money in it. Look, uh, first of all, you got to find a deposit. And that's very hard to do. Uh, you're wandering around with your mule and a pick in the mountains or the desert. Very hard to find something, even using high-tech equipment, which they can use today. So it costs you hundreds of thousands of dollars up front or millions up front with no hope of any, well, no hope of anything. So that's, and then your problems really start if you find a possible deposit. Then you have to start drilling it and bringing crews in to do all kinds of trenching and sampling and so forth. And now you could spend millions of dollars, and your trouble hasn't, your your your, your nightmare hasn't even really started yet, uh, because. If you found something that looks like it's <clears throat> viable, now you have to send in drills and, and bigger crews, and you're spending millions of dollars, perhaps now tens of millions, to prove up the deposit existing. Mm -hmm. um, and then it gets worse, 
Because now if you start to build the mine, it's going to cost you not just tens of millions, it's going to cost you hundreds of millions or maybe billions. But still you don't have anything because from the time you start, you get your permits to build the mine, which can take years today, till the time it goes into production, it could take you a decade. Meanwhile, all this money is tied up. And even then, there's no guarantee that you're going to make any money on the mine. In fact, if it looks like you're going to make any money, <clears throat> then the government is going to start attacking you for more taxes, more royalties. They know you can't move your asset. Um, NGOs, which are the bane of, should be the bane of everybody's existence today. These non-governmental organizations, there are thousands of them. They're like bed bugs throughout the investment landscape today. <clears throat> they start attacking you on environmental and other reasons. You get native groups that attack you, not in your backyard people. It, it's a horrible industry. Only an idiot goes into the resource business today. So why am I in it? Well, I gave you the bad news. The good news is these stocks are very volatile. And because of all the problems, sometimes you can buy them cheap. And when the public psychology changes momentarily, they go for wild rides. I've been in stocks that haven't gone just 10 to one. I've been in 100 to one stocks. I've actually been in 1,000 to one stocks. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking over a lifetime. I'm talking over eh, three, four, five years. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got to make a distinction here between resources and mining as a business and speculating in the stocks as a business. There are two very different things. But in order to speculate in the stocks as a business, you've got to have a lot of knowledge about mining as yeah. a business. But in terms of uh, uh, on the investing side of things and being, you know, speculating into these different mining businesses, you know, let's let's dig into that. You know, what what is your investing thesis then? You know, what what do you look for when you're considering a potential new investment in uh, in, in one of these junior mining companies? Well, um, I've developed a mnemonic called the eight P's. Things that um, I try to discipline myself to look at before I put my money into any stock. Because in the mining business, uh, promoters can make these stories sound very good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it goes from their dream and your money to their money and your dream once you buy the shares. So I've, I've tried to be more, become more selective uh, as time has gone by. And um, I've developed these things I call the eight Ps. Uh, the first of them is people, the people involved in the deal. Uh, I mean, I, an idiot, a chimpanzee can actually find a, a deposit uh, but then there are all the problems that get in, you get into after you find a deposit, of course. But the first thing on my list is people. Who are the people involved in it? That's more than 50% of it right there. If you do nothing but follow really good, competent people uh, getting into deals that they're in, that's by far the most important thing. But how do you know who the good people are? Good question. Well, you're going to have to spend time with them. Yeah, you're going to have to spend time with them and look at where they've been, what they've done. You know, so it's a matter of psychology, among other things. But that's number one. Then the second thing is, what's the property in question? Because um, uh, good people can turn a nothing company uh, into the new Golconda, but bad people can turn the best property into, in the world, can turn a dream property uh, into a nightmare. But you have to look at the property. And in order to assess property, you've got to develop some knowledge about geology and the technical aspects of mining engineering and so forth. Okay, people, you look at that. The property, you look at that. The financing, spelled with the PH, these are Ps for mnemonic purposes. Uh, <laughs> can these people raise money? Do they have money? Um, because this is a very, 
capital intensive business, then you got to look at the politics. Where is it? What's the likelihood the government is going to steal the property, either wholesale or indirectly through taxes or make the thing unviable through regulations? So you got to look at the politics. And then you got to look at, are these people uh, capable of promoting the property? Now, reality always comes out, but uh, it helps if a stock is properly promoted. And on the other hand, if a stock is overly promoted, maybe you don't want to buy it because it's way ahead of itself. So you got to look at what they're doing that way or not doing. Then you got to look at the paper. Who owns all the stock? Now, when you're talking about General Motors or General Electric, who cares who owns the stock? Because it's so huge. Uh, and those are both dead ducks, dead men walking. Uh, I'm not interested in them, incidentally. But um, who owns the paper of these small micro-cap and uh, nano-cap companies? Are good people, bad people? When they pay for their paper, are they likely to blow it off into the market? Uh, that's a whole other story. We could talk about that. And you got to look at the push. What's the catalyst that's going to make the stock move? Uh, is it a good deal that you're going to be sitting on for the next 10 years that goes nowhere? Uh, you got to look at a catalyst. And then the last thing is, what are the pitfalls? Uh, what can go wrong? Uh, and when you're talking to the management, I always ask them towards the end of an interview, what can go wrong? And they'll tell me something. And then I say, okay, that's good. Uh, what else can go wrong? And generally, when you ask it a second time, uh, that's when you get the real answer, what's in the back of their mind, mm -hmm. but they didn't want to say up front. Mm -hmm. So, because there's a thousand things that can go wrong with mining companies, resource companies of any type. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's the way I proceed about these things. That's my methodology. Mm -hmm. And uh, saying it is one thing, doing it effectively is another, of course. Mm -hmm. So Doug, where, in terms of the discovery phase, you know, finding... A potential new investment. You know what? How do you go about uh, using the resources that you have, or what resources do you use to go and find a, a potential new investment to then go into your process? Well, there are probably in the world about two or three thousand resource companies. Uh, they come and go, so. I don't know what the exact number is. And a lot of companies say they have gold or gold or nickel or copper is in their name, but they don't have any. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say, but let's say there's about 3000 companies in the world you can look at. Um, well, I don't do this myself anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got guys that kind of do this for me. Number one, uh, guys that write our newsletters for us. And then the other thing is, I know lots of people in the business. Sure. And I'm friends with them. And if I see a good deal, I call them. If they see a good deal, they call me. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, uh, so that's I, how I go about it. But, so, I, uh, so I then, I guess, I guess maybe I'll adjust my question to say, you know, how back, you know, uh, maybe, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you know, like, what, what was it like then? I mean, now we have so much information coming at us. And, you know, over the years, you develop a network. But when you're just starting out, I mean, what, what were you, what were you doing? Yeah, this is a big problem. Uh, somebody that's just starting out and wants to get into this area. It's a minefield, because they don't know anything. They don't know anything about the people. They don't know anything about the properties or how to assess them. Uh, most people haven't traveled. They don't know anything about the politics in these countries. You know, so this is, I'd counsel anybody not to get involved in this area because it's so specialized and so dangerous. And the chances are when the average guy gets involved in the mining development exploration business, he's getting involved in it because he's hearing about it in the popular press on 
the newspapers and radio and that's the worst time to get involved in it. That's when the stocks are overpriced. That's when I hope I'm selling my stocks. Mm. So I don't encourage anybody to get involved in this area, which is um, kind of perverse because KC Research publishes newsletters <laughs> that talk about these mining stocks. <laughs> so, well, um, well, I guess you know, it's, it's, that, it's a real comment. <laughs> Well, Doug, that actually that actually leads into my next question because let's say they hear this interview and they're like, ah, Doug, I don't care. I still love, you know, turning over the rocks. You know, I I, I love I love geology. I'm fascinated. I wanted to be a paleontologist when I was a kid too. You know, so I, I want to learn more. You know, so I mean, you you face the similar challenge. You know, you're 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 not technically a geologist. You don't have that degree. You know, so you were able to to move past that. So. You know, how were you able to to move past that potential pitfall or, you know, uh, uh, I guess something that would maybe turn you off to the industry because it's so technical? You know, what what did you do to move past that? Well, um, by making lots and lots of expensive mistakes. (laughs) Uh, And being a geologist, incidentally, doesn't save you from making expensive mistakes. In fact, being a geologist might actually cost you more money because, uh, first of all, geology is a borderline science. Among real scientists, physicists, chemists, uh, um, people like that, uh, mathematicians, I mean, uh, they make fun of, they make fun of geologists because, uh, it's a very inexact science. Uh, it's, how can I say this? Uh, nobody really knows what's right under the surface of the earth. Uh, and if you go a couple of yards under the surface, you don't know what's under that and what's under that. So it's all guesswork. It's guesswork where things have moved around and faulted and volcanoes have gone off and asteroids have struck. It's, it, it, it's guesswork, mm-hmm. geology. Uh, it's getting better, but it's, it, it's a, a new and extremely inexact science. And geologists, uh, who I would define basically as, if you, if you know many geologists, they're typically what I would define as outdoorsy intellectuals. That's, that's who they are. Um, <laughs> Trying to use the scientific method in areas that don't lend themselves very well to science. Uh, I enjoy their, their company and all that, but you'll find that a lot of geologists very sincerely will fall in love with the project. Mm-hmm. And uh, they'll go down a rabbit hole and there's nothing at the bottom of the, bottom of the rabbit hole. Uh, it's better being a cold-blooded speculator that assesses these things from a distance than being a geologist that falls in love with this product project, which which many of them do for all kinds of reasons. So what I'm saying is not being a geologist is not a particular disadvantage in this area. It's better to be a generalist, in my opinion, mm-hmm. that assesses these things from uh, 30,000 feet mm-hmm. than a geologist that has his boots in the mud. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I love geologists. <laughs> I just want to say that. I don't know if I've been clear about it. But, no, no. Uh, no, no, that. You know, it's not necessary to be a geologist to, uh, to do this effectively. Mm-hmm. So actually, in I fact, want... it may be a, a disadvantage to be a geologist. I've, I've lost so many money, so much money uh, getting into stupid deals and following intelligent geological theories from intelligent geologists, uh, which, of course, is when I started investing, that's why I said, hey, if I just found a real growth company, and none of these mining stocks are growth companies, incidentally, they're all speculations. They are not investments. A reasonable investment, an investment is a, an investment is something where you put a dollar in the reasonable hope that it'll turn into two dollars. How? by creating a product, by actually making new wealth uh, in a predictable way. Uh, 
these stocks are all speculations. They're not investments. Uh, speculations are very, very different things. Uh, a speculation, by one definition I use anyway, is a, is a politically caused distortion in the marketplace. And the ideal speculation is something like gold was back in 1971. It had been suppressed in price by the government from 1933 to 1971. Prices of everything else had gone way up over that 40-year period, and gold exploded. Now, those, that kind of a speculation doesn't occur every day. But uh, you're always looking for some way to bet against the government, if you possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, but it's different from investing, very different from investing. Right. And both speculating and investing are very different from saving. And people confuse these these three things. Um, and and so actually, I wanted to go back to your your process, the eight P's. You know, and you in I think in in politics, uh, promoting paper, um, you talked about you know some of the things you look for within those uh, those things that you look or, or within those those P's. You know, but in terms of uh, for instance, like uh, people and property and financing as well as catalysts, you know, what are, what are the things within those categories that you look for in a potential investment? Huh. Well, I guess this is a question where experience uh, plays a, a big part, mm -hmm. but um, I, I don't know the, each of these areas, you could write a book on, frankly, uh, how you promote a concept, how you promote a stock. Um, there's all kinds of avenues, uh, ways of doing it, uh, so looking like, at the politics of a country. I mean, so I would say like, for instance, I, I mean, it's I'll, here, I'll, I'll help. I'll help steer it. So let, let's say, for instance, with people. You know, we do. Do you tend to look for for management teams that um, have uh, maybe done a similar deal at a similar type property? Do you want to make sure that they've also worked in that country? Um, they've mined for that same resource, but in multiple countries. You know, obviously, you want them to be successful. But you know, so so what? Maybe you can elaborate on that. Or those? Am I kind of hitting the? The nail on the head there when it comes to the types of people you want to be in. Oh, oh, the company. you are. You're, you're yes. absolutely correct. Okay. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely you're absolutely correct in that. But the most important thing is the character of the people. Mm. In other words, uh, bad people make for bad business. Good people tend to make for good business. Mm. So the first thing is the ethics of the people. Because if the management of the company are, are, have basically a criminal mindset, uh, they're going to steal all the money. They're going to screw everything up. They can turn a, uh, a wet dream into a nightmare. So uh, the character of the people is more important than their experience or their knowledge base or things or technical things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So if when I'm I meet some, somebody, if I just don't like them, forget about it. Right. Uh, if I, it, there's a lot of fish in the sea. Sure. So that's number one. Mm -hmm. And then, and then in terms of the, uh, when you're evaluating a potential property, I mean, is there any certain resource that is kind of within your wheelhouse or do you not, are you very uh, resource agnostic and then you more are looking at the project itself and where it's located and, and stuff like that? Well, look, in, in assessing these different elements um, and different minerals, there's 92 uh, naturally occurring elements uh, on planet Earth. And let's look at two of my favorites, gold and uranium. Uh, right now, and they're two of my favorites, uh, very different from each other. They move for different reasons. Uh, all their characteristics are quite different. 
you got to look at their the average cost of production. And for gold, maybe for a big mining company, all in sustaining production costs. I mean, look, this is, it can get very technical. What's the, what does it cost you to produce an ounce of gold? Mm -hmm. Well, it's the cash cost, you can say, after you put in your, your plant and equipment and uh, all of your other costs are, are there. Now, what's the cost is to actually produce an ounce of gold? Not counting what it costs to, to, re, to clean up the uh, site after you mine up all the gold. Not, not counting anything. Maybe it'll cost $400 an ounce, but you add in uh, all the various amortizations and the environmental costs and this and, and, and the cost of replacing the resource so that once the resource is mined out, you got nothing in the company and it's worth zero. So you got to add in the cost of finding more resources. Uh, maybe now you're talking about average $1,200 per ounce across the industry, which is not very much above what the price of gold is right now. And most of the gold that's been mined throughout history is still in existence. I mean, it hasn't been dissipated or consumed the way oil is. Once oil is mined, if you would, it's gone, or coal it's mined, it's gone. Gold still exists, it's in a vault someplace. So you gotta cut, figure that in. It's, the price of gold isn't determined by by uh, how much is produced, it's, produ it's, it's determined by who wants to buy it and who wants to sell it. Very different from, let's say, uranium, uh, where there's a constant demand from the world's 400 nuclear plants, and soon there's going to be 600, so the demand is going to go up. Uh, cost of production, very volatile. Each one of these metals, every one of them, has different characteristics, uh, both in how you find them, how you produce them, the supply and demand characteristics, uh, future prospects for use. Uh, it, it's quite fascinating uh, and, and quite complex. Mm -hmm. And then another another question I had too regarding your 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 uh, your eight Ps also is. Uh, in regards to push and the catalysts you look for, you know, what, what are, for example, some of those catalysts you look for? Hmm. Well, in the case of gold, it's a monetary crisis. When uh, people fear uh, the stability of currencies, uh, and of course all the currencies in the world today are basically just floating abstractions they're really just toilet paper that are accepted out of custom or out of force because governments make you accept them within their borders. So the big catalyst, the big push thing for gold <clears throat> is a monetary crisis. And I think we're heading towards the biggest monetary crisis in history. I think it's coming up bigger than the monetary crisis of 1971, for instance. So um, that's the push for gold. What's the push for uranium? Well, right now it's very cheap at around $23 an ounce. It's um, almost no uranium in the world is being produced profitably at this point. So there are existing inventories of it that are being consumed. There's a lot more nuclear plants that are being built primarily by China and India, but a lot of other countries. But um, with hundreds of nuclear plants that are being built by the Chinese and the Indians in particular, there's going to be a lot more demand for it. Uh, and in the recent past, it's been as high as 140. But, you know, I don't want to talk about uranium in particular. Sure. Uh, all of these metals and minerals have their own characteristics. Mm -hmm. So, so I wanted to, to, uh, now talk about uh, one of your newsletters, uh, that you have out there, uh, it, called international man. You know, you mentioned in the about section for, for this newsletter that, uh, in quote, 
In short, international diversification is prudent because it frees you from absolute dependence on any one country, end quote. Why? Risk is great in the world. And you've got two basic types of risk. You've got market risk or investment risk, and you've got political risk. And right now, the market or investment risk is very, very high. The stock market is in a bubble, a historic bubble. Uh, the bond market is in a hyper bubble, a super bubble with interest rates at or approaching zero in most countries around the world. Real estate floats on a sea of debt. And with the interest rate on debt, as low as it is, real estate in most places, certainly all the big cities in the world, is also in a bubble. So you've got huge risk in the markets, but as great or maybe greater than that is political risk. Because when you're a citizen of a country and you live in that country, the government of that country treats you as a milk cow. And the government's main interest is itself. It's a discrete entity, much like a corporation, Apple or General Motors are mainly interested in themselves. Well, the same is true of a government. Its own interests come first. And if they have to use their citizens, not just as milk cows paying taxes, but as beef cows, they'll do it. So it's uh, critical to you to diversify internationally so that all of your assets aren't under the control of one group of politicians. Because I know that nobody likes politicians in theory, but oddly enough, every X number of years, they go out and vote for them and they support them and they put their little posters on their front lawns. This is completely insane. The worst kind of person becomes a politician. I mean, politics draws the kind of people that like to control other people. Uh, horrible uh, types of human beings, glib, smarmy, slick, uh, pathological liars that'll tell you anything you wanna hear. What you have to do is diversify so that all of your assets aren't under the control of any one group. Better to have a second or a third country around the world where you're seen as a tourist, a rich tourist who needs to be cultivated and treated well, as opposed to a citizen who can be used as a milk cow. So that's my main argument for diversifying internationally. Don't have all your eggs in one basket because any one country, the bottom can fall out of the basket unpredictably. Who could have guessed uh, in, let's say, 1910 that by 1920, Russia would have turned into the Soviet Union? Nobody would have guessed that. Who would have guessed in 1930 that by in a few years, Germany would have transformed itself? Who would have guessed uh, what would have happened in Rwanda? Uh, where it turned into an overnight bloodbath. Uh, who would have guessed what would have happened in Vietnam? These countries go through cyclical disasters. So if you've got all your eggs in that one basket, uh, you may lose everything you have, including your life. So uh, I urge people to go to internationalman.com. It's a free blog, actually. And... Uh, Keep up with it. It's very interesting. And we cover this and many, many other topics uh, in it. Mm -hmm. So are you looking mostly at, at countries where there is kind of a crisis going on? Or are you mostly looking at maybe uh, uh, emerging economies on the, you know, maybe on the rise? I mean, you know, what, what, what exactly are you, are you, you know, discussing as well in, in the newsletter that's actionable? You know, you know what I'm saying? Well, I cover the waterfront, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, countries that have stable socio-political socio -political situations, socio-political economic situations, places that are good mm -hmm. and appear that they will stay good. Mm -hmm. 
countries that are in a position of disaster mm-hmm. where you can you can um, follow the advice of the original Baron de Rothschild and buy when blood is running in the streets. So take your choice. Gotcha. So we look at everything and not always things that are directly actionable. Because my feeling is that most Americans have not even traveled outside of America, don't even have passports. And the ones that have traveled have just gone as a tourist and skated over the surface of the country. So we have a lot of, it's a free publication. So there's a lot of education that we, we try to make available to our, our readers. It's, it's very important to internationalize because look, if you just look at opportunities in one country, maybe your country's experience are gonna experience a bear market for some years in the future. It would be wiser if you're looking everywhere, maybe you can go to a country that has a bull market. Or maybe you can find a country that's at the top of a bubble mania and go short. Now, no t- there's no guarantees that you'll correctly diagnose these things when you see them. But if you have a, a broad view, the chances are better that you'll find an opportunity to go long or short as mm-hmm. opposed to just looking in one, one little pond uh, in the whole world. Mm-hmm. So... My next question then is, you know, kind of going along those lines where, and I don't want to assume that you're, you know, you're against uh, uh, centralized governments and 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 whatnot. You know, I, you clearly have a distrust in politicians, you know, and that tends to make up what governments are, you know, comprised of. But, you know, in that sense, I, I mean, I'm just curious your thoughts on on cryptocurrencies. You know, I mean, uh, the fundamental idea behind di- these digital assets assets seems to kind of fall in line with your with your uh with your thought process well first of all speaking to government uh i think the institution of government itself is innately destructive and um unnecessary in today's world uh why do i say that it's because government uh, or the state uh, to be more accurate is based on coercion, it's based on force. There's no voluntarism about it. Uh, And this whole idea of democracy uh, is a sop. It's, uh, you're just voting for the people that are going to be telling you what to do with your lives. And the fact that 51% of the people are voting for something doesn't mean that they're voting for uh, the correct or ethical thing, in fact, you might find out that 51% of the people vote to steal everything from the other 49% of the people. So I think the people ought to relate in terms of the market and volunteerism and providing goods and services to other people, whereas the government, uh, the government as an institution is centered around things like wars, taxes, regulations, pogroms, persecutions. So no, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm opposed to the idea of the state. Now, talking about cryptocurrencies, uh, one of the great disasters that government uh, has foisted upon humanity is currency. Uh, for many thousands of years, gold was used as money. It's a medium of exchange and a store of value. And banks were just places that you could store money uh, securely and borrow in London. They're just businesses like any others. But government has has totally distorted the concept of money where we use paper issued by fiat instead of gold. And banks are nothing like what they were uh, in the 19th century. Um, So, of course, this got me interested in cryptocurrencies. And cryptocurrencies have been very, very good to me. But uh, and and I think they're going to continue because it allows people to have a medium of exchange and a store of value uh, without the government getting involved, uh, where you can have wealth and transfer wealth without using the state or one of its minions as an intermediary. So yeah, I'm a a big supporter of cryptocurrencies. 
the problem with them right now is that there's a couple thousand of them. And it's like junior mining stocks. Most of these cryptocurrencies are crap and they're not going to survive. But the principle behind them is excellent. And uh, they're worthwhile monitoring. And hopefully we're going to get a uh, at least a dead cat bounce uh, in this area. Mm -hmm. um, it's still a bear market now. It peaked in December of last year, December of 17. And they've been going down for the last six months. Uh, I don't know where the bottom is. And there are new cryptocurrencies that are going to be issued that could have huge potential. But, um, you know, it's, it, cryptocurrencies are, this is the advantage, I've got to say, Bobby, of looking at all areas of market. Because if I hadn't had my antenna out looking for something that's going on that was outside of my bailiwick, I never would have gotten involved in them. And they've been very, very good to me. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where the next cryptocurrency equivalent is going to be or what the next cryptocurrency itself is going to be. But uh, uh, by looking at everything, hopefully I'll see it and recognize it when I see it. Mm -hmm. So now, now I know I can do a, we can do a whole interview on your first book, uh, Crisis Investing. Um, in fact, in preparing for this interview, I watched your, your original 1980 interview with, uh, with Phil Donahue and, uh, you know, while uh, I think that interview is about 45 minutes, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to dig in a little bit here and, and kind of get, you know, uh, for those who may not have, you know, may not have even heard the book yet, you know, and with that, you know, what, what is, was the message that you're, you were trying to convey with crisis investing and the idea behind it? What I was trying to do, yeah, what I, was, what I was trying to do was explain some basic tenets of economics and finance uh, and put them all in context. And I've done more since then, obviously. Uh, my basic view on the world is this. It's that Western civilization which is the best thing that's ever happened to humanity in all of its 200,000 year history, peaked in about 1914 before the First World War. And civilization has actually been going downhill since then, even while technology has been compounding at the rate of Moore's Law since then. So uh, this puts me in a, an odd conundrum where on the one hand, I can see the values that have given us everything that is important today. Things like uh, freedom, personal freedom, uh, sound money, limited government. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that, is that Western civilization, in other words, the ethical and philo philosophical foundations of it peaked over a hundred years ago. And it's been going downhill since then. At the same time, the things that Western civilization has given birth to, uh, science and technology uh, in particular, have been expanding at a compounding rate uh, since for the last 200 years since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. So I don't know how things are going to end up. I don't know if they're going to end up with World War III, which will be, could be much, much worse than World War I or World War II, because the state has been growing in power uh, immensely uh, since about 1914. Uh, it's, it's hard to say. At the same time, uh, with the development of things like uh, artificial intelligence and robotics and the uh, biological genetic revolution, which is going on now, the privatization of space exploration, uh, there's so many good things that are going on. At the same time, is there so many bad things going on? And I'm just not sure whether a monetary collapse 
an economic collapse, uh, wars uh, between these various governments. I don't know what force is going to win. This makes it hard for me to decide, do I want to be bullish or bearish on the stock market, the bond market, the commodities market, for instance. We're, we're now in the early stages of developing nanotechnology, which is the construction of machines from the bottom up. In the past, we've been miniaturizing everything, making computers smaller, making transistors smaller, miniaturizing everything, making things smaller and more compact and efficient. But we're reaching a stage now where with nanotechnology, we're going to construct machines atom by atom, molecule by molecule from the bottom up, uh, including computers, including machines that will create other machines this is going to change the whole character of life so that uh, there's a, a lot of major trends which, which are coming to a head. Uh, Ray Kurzweil has described this elegantly in his book, The Singularity is Near, which I recommend everybody read, incidentally. Um, it approaches the nature of life and reality from a very different supplementary, but very different point of view than the other books I recommended earlier, which were, uh, well, economics in one lesson, for instance. So uh, we actually live at the most exciting time in human history. And uh, I'm convinced that if we were to have this conversation only 20 years from now, the entire character of life is going to have changed for all kinds of reasons. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what... I mean, I, I couldn't have reasonably made this. I couldn't have reasonably made that statement 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. But today, I feel it's actually a reasonable thing to say. So what's so? I think what's I mean, you know, I, I kind of want to. I'm I'm interested because you know some people might hear this and think, oh, you know, this is kind of like a gloom, doom, and you know, uh, there's a crisis coming, or you know, there's going to be this cloud. But it's it's you're coming from a place from what I understand is like, uh, you know, all not that all civilization is going to be over like we know it. It's more like, a, you know, everything is advancing at such an exponential rate that there has to be at some point a uh, um, uh, a re a re uh, I, I guess the word not reevaluation, but maybe a re leveling, so to speak. You know, am I? Am, am I kind of getting the gist yeah. right, right there? Reordering. Reordering, yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, exactly. My, my The way I see things at this point is that the, the future is not only going to be better than we imagine, but better than we can imagine because of the compounding rate of technology. Uh, all kinds of technologies uh, that I mentioned before, not just computer technology and artificial intelligence, but... Uh, uh, the biological genetic revolution, uh, uh, space exploration, which has been privatized. Uh, and, and of course, nanotechnology is by far the biggest one of all. So uh, these things are going to be extremely good. Uh, just like the invention of the printing press changed the nature of the world and liberated it the average guy, and greatly improved the standard of living. And the invention of gunpowder before that liberated the average guy and gave him the possibility of, of taking out the heavily armored mounted knight that was suppressing him. All these new technologies are going to be similar in nature to that. That's the good news. But the bad news is that as new technologies develop, generally it's the current powers that be that have them first and control them. And that's the way it is right now for some of these new technologies, but it won't stay that way forever. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm a real technophile and uh, uh, I love the advances that are being made in all these different areas. They're gonna help us so, uh, immensely and sooner than we think and in, in much bigger terms than we think. That's why I say that if we'd had this conversation 
20 years ago. Sure. Uh, I couldn't have reasonably said these things, but it, it seems apparent that, that I can say these things today. But at the same time, we've got other problems. Mm -hmm. We've got the uh, growth of the state. We've got the dissolution of the values that created Western civilization that made all these things possible. And these things are crumbling right out from under us. Mm -hmm. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens and, and how. I mean, the changes are going to be huge, mm -hmm. but somewhat unpredictable. Mm -hmm. So then, Doug, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, for me, it, you know, because you have, you have two, th two sides to, to your thought process. You know, you're innately, a, you know, also a technophile. But at the same time, you know, you have this love of geology and resources. So in essence, you know, your, your foray into investing in resources as, a, as an investment vehicle is almost like a hedge. Because on one hand, you know, you love the geology, you love the, that aspect of it. But at the same time, you know that these are also raw materials that help power some of these new technologies that are coming forth. You know, I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that evaluation. No, you're quite correct. Because commodities and the things that come out of the ground are the raw materials of civilization itself. Mm -hmm. So... I find this is uh, as, as bad an industry as mining is. Uh, it's not going to go away, or at least until we start mining the asteroids. Uh, but even then, it's not going to go away. Right. Because, uh, you know, you can't have progress without material things. And quite frankly, all of the material things that we use in day-to-day -day civilization, people don't... People don't think about where they come from, and they all come from out of the ground. Mm -hmm. Right. And I guess even, even to take it a step further in, in terms of the, the actual hedge part is that, you know, from the, on a crisis investing side, you would also say, well, then I would also turn to resources because that's been the traditional store of value. You know, which is, you know, so you have that just in case there is that crisis. But then at the same time, as things technically evolve, you know that in order to see those things advance, you need the raw materials. You know, so I, I'm pretty sure. I, yeah, it's, yeah. It's exactly. I mean, look at, you know, you, you know, you're quite correct. I mean, look at gold. Mm -hmm. In Roman times, uh, it wasn't economic to mine gold unless you found a deposit that was maybe an ounce per ton or at least a half an ounce per ton even with slave labor in those primitive times you needed a very rich deposit to mine gold but over the last 2000 years all of the easy to find gold deposits in the world have actually been found because you've had billions of people looking for them and today as a result of it we can mine gold not in a grade of one ounce per ton, but one one hundredth of an ounce per ton. But it's much harder to find, and you need more capital to do it and more technology to do it. And it's the same way with all of the elements. Uh, they're harder to find, they're much more disseminated, they're much lower grade, they take a lot more capital to find than they did in the past. Uh, but you can't do without them because everything from the car you drive to the house you live in to the silverware you eat with, it's all the product of mining. And with more people in the world, all of whom have a higher standard of living and, and want a higher standard of living in the past, you're going to need more of these things. Look, even if you have a car, you probably want two cars, or maybe you want three cars. If you have a house, you want not just one, maybe you want two or maybe three houses. And I'll multiply this by not just uh, a few hundred million people in the advanced societies, but the billions of people all over the world. There's going to be continual demand for more resources. It's, it's very clear. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, these technologies like nanotechnology are going to make it, it's going to be like pixie dust, making it much easier to get these resources. So there's a lot of conflicting 
trends in the world and determining uh, which ones are most important and which ones are going to happen first, mm-hmm. it's a problem. And it's not easy, but it's what I try to do. Mm-hmm. So, so Doug, I, you know, I, I want to take it back to your experience, you know, I mean, what, what investing experience most informed your, your current investing thesis? Uh, losing money. <laughs> uh, like everybody else, I've done a lot of stupid things. Mm-hmm. And uh, at this stage of my life, I just don't want to do any more stupid things. It's embarrassing. <laughs> it's painful. <laughs> And it limits, my options, it limits my options for the future. So oddly enough, uh, I've become more conservative as I've learned more. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's an old saying, fools rush in. Sure. Uh, why do they rush in? They're fools because they don't know enough not to rush in. Mm-hmm. So I've become more cautious. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess having lost a lot of money, I've made a lot and I've lost a lot made more than I've lost, obviously, a lot more. But um, uh, I think people do tend to become more cautious, at least financially, as they get older. But on the other hand, uh, I've become uh, more adventurous and freewheeling uh, on a philosophical, uh, intellectual, uh, from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. I see more possibilities. Uh, The knowledge that I've gained have allowed, has allowed me to be more cautious financially, but more adventurous philosophically. Mm-hmm. And I was always rather adventurous philosophically. Mm-hmm. So then what advice do you have for new microcap investors looking to enter the market? Hmm. Well, uh, try not to uh, learn too much by losing money. Uh, that's some advice that I would give that I wish somebody had given to me, quite frankly. I had to learn it myself. Uh, one, one thing that you have to do, and I did a lot of it, but I realized I could have done a lot more, is just read. You've got to read everything. Uh, you've got to read about science. You've got to read about technology. You've got to read about ancient history. Uh, You've got to cover the waterfront. You've got to try to become, intellectually at least, a a Renaissance man who can speak intelligently with a modicum of knowledge based on sound grounding on on almost every subject. I'm not saying to be uh, an expert or a specialist in every subject. That's impossible. But with a sound grounding in all areas of um, all areas of life, it'll improve your judgment. And in the end, judgment is what separates uh, the rich guys from the poor guys, I think. Mm -hmm. So you've got to read more, you've got to learn more, you've got to watch more. In other words, instead of spending, uh, uh, you know, uh, an hour watching some stupid reality show, turn on the Discovery Channel and learn about some area of science or technology that you may not currently know about. That's the advice in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. So you're also going to be speaking at the Sprout Natural Resource Symposium later in July. Uh, What will you be speaking about? You know, I think they've assigned me a topic. Uh, Whether I stick to that topic or not is still an open question. (laughs) Uh, the Sprott Show is only about uh, three weeks from now, but for all I know, the entire world could change radically in three weeks. And I have to adopt. I may have to adopt my speech to that. Uh, what's the topic they've assigned me? Uh, you know, I can't remember right now, but uh, I'll try to make it interesting and entertaining for the audience, mm-hmm. and, and meaningful, right. uh, and valuable. Not just interesting and entertaining, but valuable. Right. So. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> and uh, and also, so to see you speak, uh, yeah. I advise my audience go to uh, SprottNaturalResourceSymposium.com. And uh, and Doug, you know, as we wrap up here, you know, where can my audience go and find more information about you and Casey Research? Uh, go to CaseyResearch.com mm-hmm. or go to International Man. 
www.ghostbusters.com. Those are the two websites. We've got a, a lot of free and good things there. Uh, in fact, I, I often wonder why anybody sends money to, to, to uh, subscribe to our paid publications because the free stuff is frankly so good. Uh, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, <it's true. laughs> I love it. So, uh, Doug, thank you so much uh, for my, pub- my, pub- <laughs> my publisher won't like to hear that. But there's a lot of truth to it. Don't worry, I'm not going to send it to them. <laughs> um, so, 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 Doug, th- I want to say thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your time, and uh, you know, I, I'm glad we made it through the whole interview. We're uh, only a couple stops because of uh, the technical issues. <laughs> Okay. Well, it's been fun talking to you, Bobby, and I look forward to seeing you up there in Vancouver. Same here. Thank you, Doug. Have a good one. Okay. Thanks, Bobby. Okay. Okay. Thank you all for tuning in to the Planet Microcap podcast, and thank you, Doug, again for coming on to the program. You can access the podcast by going on to stocknews.com under podcast, go to podbean.com and search Planet Microcap podcast, or on iTunes and search Planet Microcap podcast. Stay tuned for the next Planet Microcap podcast where we'll have our next guest to discuss all things microcap. If you have any questions or comments about the podcast, please send an email to info at snnwire.com. I'd love to hear from all of you. This podcast has been brought to you by SNN Incorporated, publishers of stocknewsnow.com, the official microcap news source, and the microcap review magazine. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you again for joining me on the Planet Microcap podcast. Have a great week, everyone. 